Okay, if you have your copies of the Bible, go ahead and grab them out. And uh, we're going to be moving around just a bit this morning. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks, several really, since our last lesson together. And uh, if you'll remember, we began to look at the second C of history, corruption. Remember, there were things that happened when corruption entered into God's perfect creation. And when we were together last time, we saw that Adam had rebelled against God's command and he ate the fruit that Satan uh, uh, had deceived Eve into eating. Eve gave it to Adam. And because God is a just God and because God must punish sin, um, uh, things changed. And yet in God's mercy, he showed mercy to Adam and Eve by covering their sin with the skins of an animal. And this was a, a foreshadowing of the fact that a perfect lamb would come, one who John the Baptist called the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And who was that perfect lamb? Of course, that lamb was Jesus. And you might remember even back in the garden, Adam and Eve tried to cover up their sin and shame with leaves. Today, we try to do the same things. We say, well, I'll try to be good enough. I'll try to earn God's favor. I'll try to do whatever I can so long as I'm not like Hitler, a mass murderer or something. We, we, we do this rationalizing and this justifying of ourselves. And yet we know our only hope in this life and the next is Jesus Christ. So what I want to do today is I want to look at the effects of Adam's fall. What happened not only to Adam and Eve, but what happened to our world? What happened to the universe? What happened to us spiritually because of what happened here with them? And one of the questions we're going to try to answer today is how much of God's creation was affected by the fall? Think about that for just a second. How much of God's creation? Remember, he created the heavens and the earth. There's no word for universe in Hebrew. So that's the way that the Bible says God created every molecule, every piece of matter, everything that exists. So how much of all of that that God created was affected by this thing that happened with Adam and Eve, okay? You don't have to answer that out loud to me right now, but maybe think about where your mind is, the things you've learned up until this point today, and how would you answer that? Okay, well, we're going to start with an activity this morning together, and we're going to take a look and begin answering that question, right? So in your packets, there's uh, an activity on page 10. If you'll just flip them over uh, to wherever that's it, it should say something like a cursed creation activity or something along those lines here. And what you're going to do is just get that page 10 folded back so you'll have access to it. And I want to ask uh, you to open your Bibles to Genesis 3, and we're going to take a look at verses 8 through 19. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 19. This is the chapter in the Bible where we find about the fall, and let me just begin reading there in Genesis 3, 8, okay? I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, very similar and close to the New American Standard Bible, in fact, used... Uh, to translate it, so if mine sounds a little different than yours, that's okay. It says, Then they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God in the middle of the trees of the garden. Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave to me from the tree and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Then listen closely, it says, Yahweh God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than any of the cattle and more than every beast of the field. 
On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and conception. In pain you will bear children. Your your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Okay. Well, there's the cursed passage. Lots of different things going on in this passage. And what I want to do together is I want us to just observe and start sharing together the curses that we see here in Genesis 3, okay? We're going to be answering the question, how much of God's creation is affected by the fall? Let's start here with the actual passage before we look at others and and figure out. So what aspects of the, the curse, and when I use that language, I'm talking about the effects of the fall of Adam and Eve on the universe. So the curse, that word, comes actually from this passage because there are things that are changed under the wrath of God because of the thing that Adam and Eve had done. Does that make sense? So sometimes people talk about it as the curse. Now that's insider language. If we talk to somebody who didn't grow up inside the church, they would not know what the curse is. That would be, you know... Uh, like those Pirates of the Caribbean movies or something like the Curse of the Black Pearl. They would not know what we were talking about. We'd have to unpack it a little bit for them, okay? But what do you see there in terms of the curse, or maybe even use the word curses, that result from the fall of Adam and Eve? Just start kind of shouting some things out. Curse on the serpent, yeah? Shame, yeah, Uh, they're aware uh, of guilt, they're aware of their nakedness, their shame for the first time, in particular in the relationship between them and God. Good, what else? Curse on the serpent, yeah, what's that curse? It's, uh, uh, well, its immediate fulfillment will be on the snake itself. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust. And then there are parts of that curse that are aimed at Satan, right? Uh, He is going to experience enmity. Some of the Bible translations say that's another word for hatred. You experience hatred between the offspring of Satan and the woman. And the offspring of the woman, who is that? Always a safe answer when you say Jesus. (laughs) It's Jesus. That's the offspring of the woman. In some ways, there's also another offspring of the woman, but here, Jesus in mind, another offspring of the woman is a covenant people redeemed by God who will eventually become Israel and the church. And so there are those who are redeemed who are the offspring, but in particular, in mind, here is Jesus, because what's he going to do to the serpent's head? Yeah crush it, right? And where is that crushing going to take place? It happens, in my backyard it happens in your backyard sometimes. Yeah, that's on the first curse of the serpent, is it? You're going to crawl on your belly and Dan is going to come and make ruin of you because you're in my yard. And I don't like you. And I don't like you. Yeah. Yep. Not only do you have Eve being cursed, but of course all women, all men. Yeah, Eve's punishment. You see it there? Uh, it includes increased pain in childbirth. There's also a tension now that exists between women and men in the marriage relationship. There's going to be a striving between. I hope that's not a shock to anybody here that's married this morning. Sometimes when I do premarital counseling for those who've never been married before and things like that, they're a little shocked that sometimes there's conflict in marriages. They think it's going to be the honeymoon all the time. (laughs) 
So I'm like, well, there's going to be, you know, some times that are a little difficult. You know, I'm trying to be gentle on them a bit. And when that happens, I want to equip you for how to do conflict with your beloved. I mean, just in case you might need that later on. Maybe. Yeah, there's enmity and there will be a desire actually to, to rule over. I would say that goes both ways, but in terms of the curse on Eve, there will be a desire for the woman to rule over uh, her husband. What's Adam's sentence? Yeah, it's going to include hard labor to produce the basic necessities of life, right? To produce food from the ground. And eventually what's now going to happen to Adam that wasn't going to happen before. He's going to return to the ground as dust. Yeah, there's going to be physical death now. This is uh, an outgrowth of the curse. You know, I, I do uh, work in the hospital as a chaplain, and a lot of times uh, chaplains are page to every code, every life-threatening thing that's going on, and every death in the hospital. And when I go into those rooms where somebody's actively dying, I, I'm seeing the fulfillment of this, right? That all of us are going to experience the physical nature of the curse. And that goes all the way back thousands of years, 6,000 to be specific, to Adam and Eve in the garden. I'm seeing in real time the effect of this curse today. And that's a hard thing. Now, also, there's an effect on creation itself. What's happening to the ground that Adam and others are going to be working. It's going to have weeds. <laughs> uh, Gideon, if you didn't detect that, had a little bitterness in his voice because he's uh, been doing some landscaping work and other things like that and pulling weeds one by one. Yeah. So, Adam's curse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That curse still finding its way in work as it comes up against the thorns of, you know, whatever, like the yeah. unjust, well, yeah, of course. But just the effect of that, it finding its way into all, all of our work. Yeah, absolutely. So Rachel was saying, you know, that. Um, that aspect of the curse, so uh, the ground itself is going to produce thorns and thistles and work itself is going to be very difficult. That doesn't mean that work itself is a cursed thing. Work actually existed before the fall. Adam and Eve were in the garden to tend the garden. And so work itself is a holy estate, the way marriage itself is a holy estate. But just like marriage being affected by the fall, work itself now, it doesn't, it's not easy. It resists the labor that we give. So when you leave these doors this morning and you go out and you have tomorrow a really difficult cubicle mate next door who's a pain in the neck to deal with, you know, I'm assuming you're innocent in all this or whatever, but, you know, that enmity that exists in the workplace or the striving that you feel in the institution of family with the estrangement between uh, another family member, whatever, all of that is the, the after effects of the fall of Adam and Eve. These things that are good at their core have become difficult and entangled with conflict because of what happened in the garden. So let me just stop right there and say that truth helps you explain, just like I did, why life can be difficult, right? Because one of the things that... That, that people who don't have any religious affiliation today, the number one thing, in fact, for those under 30 as to why they don't have a relationship with God. So when they're polled and asked, the number one reason they will say is, I never heard my family, I never heard my minister, I never had a youth minister, somebody explain how to reconcile the existence of a good God with a world that is suffering. They just never really heard something about that. And to them, it's like the existence of a good God and a suffering world, those things can't be reconciled. Yes, they can be reconciled. 
you just need to share the story, right? In the opening book of the Bible, it talks about how there was this thing that happened between Adam and Eve. And because of their disobedience to God, it has affected every aspect of life. And because of that, relationships are hard and work is hard. People die physically, and sometimes they suffer even when they die. And all of those things can be reconciled with a good God because the only one that can do anything to change that has sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to be the head crusher and to stop the suffering. He's entered into, actually, the suffering to make that happen, and he can identify with us. That story is one that we need to carry with us and to talk about with the next generations because they need to know how to reconcile what they've heard about the goodness of God with a world that's suffering. And those two things are reconcilable. You just have to have this foundational material from the book of Genesis. Does that make sense? So we see those curses here, right? And so there are curses. In fact, notice the serpent, it says, was cursed above the other animals. We can actually infer, and we know this is the case, that there is a curse now on all animals, even though the details are not spelled out here. And you see that curse if you go on to Animal Planet or one of the other shows and the lions are jumping on the poor aged and infirmed wildebeest I always feel sorry for the one animal that gets picked out you know when I was a kid I couldn't watch that I'd be like you know it was it was hard to watch it seemed terrible yesterday we went out to the Detroit Zoo and we saw the animals and things but we went into an exhibit hall where they had wildlife photography award-winning and and Trinity got sad did she cry yeah she cried. There was a, a scene where a small fawn was picked up, you know, by the scruff of its neck in the mouth of a, I guess it was a grizzly bear, a brown bear. And of course, you knew it was going to happen next and stuff. And Trinity was really bothered by that. Well, what is it in Trinity's little sympathetic and compassionate heart that's bothered? It's that the nature red in tooth and claw, that's really not the way things should be. It is the way, the thi- the way they are. But Jesus is going to return and set all this to right. And as Isaiah the prophet says, one day there's going to be a day when the lion lays down with the lamb and it's not eaten or consumed in that way, right? And so little Trinity's heart's breaking seeing that because she sees what the effects of the fall are and realizes, you know, it shouldn't be this way. That a little young innocent fawn could be consumed alive by a bear. That's terrible to think about. And so her heart's breaking for that. And the beauty of that moment, right, is that we can speak into that and say, I know that that's hard to see. That's not the way that the world started when God designed it. But humans, because they broke God's law and they brought sin into the experience, we do live in a world of suffering. But the greatest news possible is that Jesus has entered in and he's lived a sinless life and he's died and was buried and resurrected. And now we have great hope that the curse is going to be reversed. Right? See, that's how you can use kind of these real life moments to bring it back to the truth of Jesus Christ. And so understanding this is really uh, helpful. Let's turn to the Bible again. Flip back over just a couple of pages to Genesis 1. And I want to look together at verses 29 through 31 and... Um, Would somebody be willing to read just those few uh, verses for us? Reason we're turning here is there was uh, another impact of the fall was on the food supply. This might seem like a trivial issue, but it ties into a very important concept. There is a connection between death and sin. So, uh, Rachel, do you mind reading that one? She's reading Genesis 1, 29 through 31. Okay, thank you for that. So here we are, we're at the 
the end of the creation week, uh, the end of the sixth day, um, Adam and Eve are there, and um, God has commanded Adam and Eve, notice, to eat after he'd created them. He's called them to rule over the earth. Remember, we called that the dominion mandate for humanity. They're to remain here and to manage creation on God's behalf as stewards. And notice here, what does he command them to eat? while they're here after the sixth day. This is before the fall. Yep, plants with seeds and trees with fruit bearing seeds. And what does he command the animals to eat? The same thing, right? The green plants, very good. And how did God describe the condition of his creation immediately after giving this command? It is very good. He called everything that he had made very uh, good. Very, very good. Now, what does that suggest about the original diets of humans and animals? It hurts me to say this because I am not a vegetarian. It hurts me to think about a world without bacon. If any of you are vegetarian, I I do respect that. I I am not vegetarian. I know that will come as a shock. But originally, not to laugh, the creation was vegetarian. And it was true for animals. It was true for humanity. In fact, this idea of a vegetarian diet, it's confirmed later on in Genesis 3 when God tells Adam that he was to eat the plants of the field by the sweat of his brow, by the hard labor that he would do. So even after uh, that point, Adam would be fighting against the thorns and the thistles that were a part of the curse on the ground. God had provided food from the garden, but he was now in essence saying, listen, Adam, you go plant your own garden, you rebel. That's going to be hard. You're going to realize what you've lost uh, in the Eden existence, okay? Uh, Turn over to Genesis chapter 9 with me, if you will. Genesis 9, and then we're going to go into the New Testament pretty soon. We're going to... Oh, I'm sorry. Vicki. That is a great question. I don't know if everybody heard it. So Vicki asks, how long after the creation was the fall? We're not exactly sure. It doesn't tell us, but almost certainly it happens between the end of the creation week on day seven when God rests and then the events of Genesis 3. Most Bible commentators that I've read on this suggest it happens within a few days or a few weeks of Adam and Eve being created. But it's a great question. We're going to have to ask God one of these days and see. The one thing that we can say with certainty is, Did you remember hearing how God had declared everything very good at the end? It had not occurred before that. But then by the time we get to Genesis 3, the serpent in some way is possessed by Satan. And the serpent comes and is talking to Eve and begins tempting and enticing her to do the things that lead to the fall. So here's the thing that we can say by inference. Who has fallen from heaven at that point if they're possessing the serpent and coming to tempt Adam and Eve? Satan's fall has happened by then. So we know that Satan's fall had not happened uh, before day seven or before day six when all had been declared very good, but we know that Satan's fall has happened by the time Genesis 3 gets there. So it happens in that time frame. Now, in the book of Revelation, there is scripture we don't have time to go into now that talks about how Michael and the angels who were on the side of God and Lucifer and the fallen angels that go after him make war in heaven. And that event is the fall of Lucifer that brings rebellion into the creation of God. We don't understand exactly why Lucifer rebelled against God. It almost certainly has to do with the sin of pride. But that is what precipitates eventually the events of the human fall. Satan, Lucifer, his angels, they make war in heaven against Michael and his angels. 
They are defeated. They are cast down out of heaven. And then eventually Satan comes now in open rebellion against God and he tempts Adam and Eve and creation itself is uh, broken essentially by the fall of Adam and Eve. The exact timeline I'm not sure of, but those events are, are very clearly what happened and it's a terrible thing. Yeah, great question. Other questions? I am planning at some point, we're going to talk about angels in a detailed way. That's one of my favorite things to teach about. And I think it's an important study to understand that aspect of the spiritual realm, because that is certainly still a dynamic that's present with us today. It's very interesting. And the Bible has a lot to say about angels. In fact, the Bible has more to say about angels than other really incredible topics like heaven itself, which is interesting. And angels, once you start looking for angels in the Bible, they're all over the place, which is amazing. Great study, that'll be. Good. Okay, we're looking at, um, unless there's anything else, I don't want to rush. Sorry about that. Genesis 9, 1 through 3. So Adam, he's got to go plant his own garden now. And uh, another important passage that confirms this idea is found when God addresses Noah after the flood. Uh, just listen with me as I read from uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. So just to be clear here, the events of the flood, Noah and the flood, have already passed. That's talked about in chapter 7. Chapter 8 is um, when the flood dries up. And then here we are in 9, and as soon as uh, Noah and his family get off the ark, there's going to be a special covenant made with Noah, and there's still a sign of this covenant that occurs every once in a while in our world today, a visual reminder of this covenant, and you know it because when you see it, everybody takes pictures of it and they post it on Facebook. I always see pictures of the rainbows, which are exciting to me, you know. Make the Noahic covenant great again. That's what I say. Take pictures of the rainbow. But here we are. And it says in verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then notice this. And the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you, as with the green plant I give all to you. So up until this point, the official diet, if you will, of humanity was vegetarian, but now God, under the Noahic covenant, is changing that. Right? And the fear is going to be on the animals. This is actually the first time that humans are allowed to eat animals. It's probably not the beginning of rebellious people eating meat, though. It's almost certainly the case in those years between the flood and the fall that people were eating meat, but it was not sanctioned by God. And so, interesting to think about that. Uh, God says very clearly that he had given them herbs before. If there was not an earlier command to only eat the plants and herbs, then this allowance now for meat is kind of nonsensical. But this is the first time that God sanctions it and says, this is what it shall be. There's only one prohibition on eating meat. You shall not eat meat with the lifeblood still in it. Some of you who don't like rare steaks right now are saying, amen, yes, well done, at least medium well, but maybe more. And one of the reasons for that sometimes if people ask is because the lifeblood is symbolic of life itself flowing. Uh, lifeblood has been called the vitalizing principle in uh, biological organisms. And so there's something about the importance of the blood being acknowledged in that uh, prohibition. Now, let's just stop here for a moment, and let's think about the implications of this. Let me pull together some of why this is interesting. This raises some really interesting questions for people who, like me, used to be very skeptical years ago about the biblical view. So I used to ask questions, well, 
if the Bible is true about the way that things were created, why did T-Rex have these giant teeth that we see on the movies? Or, or why do snakes have things like venom? Why do armadillos need protective plates on them? You used to see them all the time, uh, Rachel can tell you. Tumbleweeds and armadillos on the highways in Texas. Uh, why did they need those protective uh, plates? That's a great question, and I think creationists who see the Bible faithfully telling us how God created, right? Uh, not long ago, not millions of years ago, thousands of years ago, originally the creation was very good. Creations have suggested several answers to explain the attack structures and the defensive structures that are uh, on animals that fit within the biblical context. And I just want to share those just real quickly with you because I think that's a question that gets raised sometimes. And if you've never thought of it, your kids will as they go to natural history museums and they see some of the things that are there. Creation scientists suggest perhaps originally these features had a good purpose, but when the environment changed and the curse began to affect creation itself, the purposes for these features changed as well. And so maybe T-Rex was there, had large teeth, but vegetarian, the curse comes, affects creation, and there's now death and destruction and carnivory and all the things happening. And formerly there, dentistry, can we say that about T-Rex, is being used for different purposes. Maybe the purpose of these forms changed. Other suggestions are that God added new features to create uh, two creatures at the curse so that they would be able to withstand the onslaught of violence that's brought on by sin. So maybe originally the am, uh, armadillo kind did not have defensive plates. But now that violence has entered the world and there are going to be things trying like predators to eat them, their bodies themselves change. That is a possibility. Uh, we know now from genetics that our genes contain a lot more information in them that are often expressed. We've learned in the last 25 years about these uh, unlocking genes called Hox genes that can actually change radically the body forms of different animals. All uh, living things that are animals possess these Hox genes. And so in many ways, scientists now know that, that animals are a little bit like a Swiss army knife. And depending how you turn on and off these genes, different forms can result. It's possible that genetically animals were affected by the fall. Although unnecessary in a perfect world, God designed the original creatures with the features they would need to live in a fallen world that God knew was coming. That's one of the things that creationists have suggested. That's kind of an interesting idea. And then finally, maybe God placed design for these features in the genes of the original creatures, but they didn't become active until after the curse. These are various explanations for why animals in the fossil record look like they do. I mean, if you've ever gone to the, the museum and seen these large carnivorous dinosaurs, they're pretty remarkable carnivores. They look like they're built for being predators. Are you telling me that they were originally vegetarian? Yes, I am. I am. Why would you say that, Matthew? Because I believe that's what the Bible's teaching. But they didn't stay that way after the fall. And we don't know exactly how these animals acquired their attack structures, but this we do know. According to God's word, remember that's our final authority, animals were originally vegetarian, and one day they will once again get along with each other as it states in Isaiah 11. The lion will lay down with the lamb. It will be a day when uh, the infant, the baby, will be able to sit next to an, an asp, a, a venomous snake, and not get bit, not get poisoned. There is going to be a reversing of the curse. That's what Isaiah the prophet prophesied. And so that's a great, a great uh, promise. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, did, did you all hear that? Uh, Rachel just made a comment. She said, one of the important things to remember is that depending on how you define evolution, evolution does or does not exist. So if somebody would say to me, I believe in evolution and that there are small changes and adaptations within animal kinds that occur so that animals can adapt to different environments, I would say to that, yes. That kind of, I wouldn't call it evolution because I think that, that's a term that's loaded with a lot of baggage. I would call that adaptation. Animals are clearly able to adapt to different types of geographical and, and climate um, uh, conditions. What's really interesting and telling about that is that um, there are no examples in the fossil record of transitional forms showing how one kind of animal has transitioned to the uh, another kind. There's a couple of very famous uh, fossil forms that are often used to try to make this case. One is a very famous uh, uh, fossil called Archaeopteryx. Has anybody heard of that one before? It's a feathered uh, I'm just going to show you, well, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's a bird <laughs> about the size of a, a, a flying chicken. If a chicken had bigger wings, it could really fly well. Archaeopteryx is also often suggested to be a, a transitional form between uh, ancient dinosaurs and modern birds, an ornithischian. That's been thoroughly debunked. Archaeopteryx was an ancient chicken. One of the others is uh, suggested to be a transitional form between um, uh, the animal that first evolutionists would suggest came out of the sea, it's called Tiktaalik. That clearly by bone structure alone has been demonstrated to be a reptile. One of the other ones very famously that suggested its transitional forms is an, an, an animal worked on by a University of Michigan paleontologist, uh, Phil Gingrich, uh, called Ambulocetus. And it's considered the ancient ancestor of um, of the whale, the whale family that lives in the ocean. That's now been debunked. It's very clear that Ambulocetus is related to the hippo kind. So not whale at all. Those are the only three examples. Now, the idea of transitional forms is very much in the air that we breathe. And I know that you actually have in your brain the thought that there's a transitional form between you and something else. Let me ask you, how many of you think that genetically we are 98 to 99% related to the chimpanzee. It's okay if you raise your hand on that, or at least you've heard that. Let me maybe put that way. Anybody heard that you're 98 to 99% related to a chimpanzee? If you've heard that, that's completely false. The way that that number first got out there was a guy back in the 1970s doing genetic work on chimpanzees was doing what's called knockout research, where he would take a small section of genetic work and he would compare it to the genome of human beings, homo sapiens. And here's how he came at that number. He took the stretch, the knockout stretch, and he took the stretch, uh, equivalent stretch in human beings, and he physically removed all of the data that didn't parallel in the human and took it out of his paper. And then he compared the two and he found that they were 99% similar. So let me say that one more time for you, for those who just, the caffeine's kicking in. He took the two stretches of gene DNA, he compared the points where they were not similar and he crossed out and took that data out of the chimpanzee uh, stretch of DNA, and then when he lined them up, he found they were 99% similar. Wow, revolutionary. That's how you get a 99% number. Here's the rest of the story. That man later becomes a creationist. He's now a creation scientist who did that original research because he knew that that was not the case. What actually is the case when you do this with knockout studies is that we, we are about... 70 to 72 percent related genetically to modern chimpanzees. About five to six percent uh, more related to chimpan chimpanzees than we are to bananas. So we're about 68 percent 
related genetically to bananas, about 72 to 76 percent related to chimpanzees. That's not great data. It doesn't make for a great story. But if you go into natural history museums today, when you find the evolution section, and there will be an evolution section, find where it says that you are 98 to 99 percent related to modern chimpanzees, and remember what I just told you. Just because it says it in plexiglass lit up in a natural history museum doesn't mean it's true. Doesn't mean it's true. And I'm not telling you to disbelieve it just because I've said it. Research it yourself. Go in and find this research. Google now has opened up a wealth to us. And just say, how do they know that? And what was the original study that proved that? And show me that in print. The thing you're going to find on the internet is the actual original scientist disproving it for you, right? Saying that's actually not the case. And let me tell you how I got to that number. Remarkable, remarkable stuff. Okay, we're almost out of time. We got to read one more passage because the original question, right, was how much of creation is affected by the fall of Adam and Eve? We haven't really fully answered that yet, okay? And so let's read one passage together and then let's be done. All right, Romans 8, 19 through 22. So Paul is here in Romans. He's talking about the present suffering of the world. You know, we look around us in the world. It's, it's really rough. It's a, it's a rough place, a lot of suffering. And yet we have this promise of a future glory, a moment that even Isaiah was talking about when things are going to get better. And he says, beginning in verse 18, we're looking at Romans 8, 18 through 22. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For, and here Paul very, very much thinking about Genesis 3. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know, notice this, that what? The whole creation, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So here's a shorthand way to refer to the entire universe. Everything God has created, all of it is groaning. And so when you watch those nature shows and that gazelle or wildebeest gets eaten and that's happening, that is creation groaning. When you see star clusters bursting, uh, you know, the Hubble telescope and the James Webb now, they're looking into and seeing things we've never seen before. And you see the violent processes of planetary bodies impacting each other. You see black hole ripping things apart. That's creation groaning. When you're fighting on Monday with your cubicle mate who's, you know, uh, playing his music too loud or he's burning that candle with that terrible sandalwood smell, whatever it is, uh, creation is groaning. When you eat that, that, that leftover dish in your refrigerator that's turned and you take a bite and you go, oh, that's not good anymore. Creation is groaning. And it's waiting for something. The sons of God to be revealed. That is to say, for us who have been redeemed to be fully redeemed. To God to bring all of the curse and reverse it. We're waiting on that. So, how much of creation has been affected? All of creation, the whole creation. And if you want to read about how great it's going to be after the curse is reversed, you can just go to Revelation 21. That's where we read the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Okay, we're out of time, friends. Let's thank God for our, our, our hope that we have in Jesus, and uh, thank you for being here this morning. God, we thank you for teaching us clearly why even though you are a good God and you're good all the time, that we see a world around us that is suffering. We know it's because of the fall of Adam and Eve. We know because all creation has been affected by what happened in the garden long ago. 
and that that creation is waiting for the full consummation of the curse being reversed. And as John writes in Revelation, that the first heaven and the first earth, they will pass away. So the reverse of that curse will be complete and and all things are going to be made new. We're looking forward to that. We long for that and we're thankful for that truth that we have hope. Hope unlike others who have hope. So God, let us be able to teach about and speak about that hope confidently to those who have no hope. Help us to do that. May your blessing be on everybody that's here this morning and those online. In Jesus' name we pray.